Innate helps companies avoid project surprises, make better informed decisions, share knowledge, and deliver better outcomes. Innate, transforming the way the world builds. Hello, Project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always good to have you with us. And I'm really excited about this podcast because we get to have a bit of a chat with James and Joe about embodied carbon, whatever that means. James, how are you, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, pal. Uh, it's, so it's 9 p.m. here. Thanks very much for keeping uh, Joe and I up. We're, uh, we're both early starters. <laughs> so this is literally midnight for us. It's definitely 12 for me. Yeah. I do apologize, but we had to get you out of bed for something because this is really important stuff. And uh, what you guys have done over the last year is incredible. And Joe, uh, whatever table or whatever side of the table you're playing today, uh, co-host or interviewee, we'd love to have you back every time. How are you, Joe? All good, all good. Looking forward to it. Fantastic. And Dale, how are you, sir? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Val. More importantly, how are you? Are you battered and bruised? How did it go? I, I am in all the places I shouldn't be, but uh, no, I'm, I'm really well, actually. I've uh, I had a good go and um, I will I'll share pictures later on. Um, but we were able to raise some money for, for charity, which is always a good thing. So about $2,000 for, uh, for the Breast Cancer Foundation and Big Brother, Big Sister. Well done, mate. Thanks, Brilliant. buddy. Well, look, uh, this is a pretty cool subject that I know nothing about, which is pretty normal for a podcast, isn't it, Dale? I mean, we... We come in here, we act as five-year-olds most days, and um, and we're always humbled by the guests that we have and the subjects that we cover. Uh, but to get to the start of it, I mean, we always start with some type of baseline definition so that us in the room can kind of grasp what you're talking about, James and Joe. And I know in the particular, there's a lot of people listening to this one. What is, James, I'll maybe start with you, what is embodied carbon and how is that relevant to projects? Okay, um, so Joe, interrupt me at any point. I think we should say that first <laughs> uh, and, and set some expectations here. So um, Joe and I are not from a carbon background. We're not heads of sustainability. We're, we're just people. We're, we're people in construction from different backgrounds. And so we'll give you the, I think we were saying before we came on air, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll give you the 101. We'll kind of give you the basics. But if anyone from zero is listening, at some point in this, we need to be very cautious that there are some brilliant people there who know this subject deeply. Uh, so we'll give you the basics and that will kind of frame the session. So Joe, what, so embodied <laughs> carbon is everything, it's, the, it's the, the carbon overhead of a project up until practical completion. So it's the extraction of materials, transport of those materials, um it's the processing assembly and construction activities it's the labor that visits the sites it's um the chemistry of what's happening inside a furnace it's uh yeah it's the the upfront process it's um joe sorry i was just about to say we've got a really cool diagram um that we can share and you can put it into the notes that really yeah, separates the difference between embodied carbon um and operational carbon and then what do they call the bit that's going when it when it goes to end of life? Yeah, end I think of it, life and circularity. Oh, the whole <laughs> there we go. Circularity. Box is in it, and so yeah. We'll, we'll, so it's a, to a, to a five year old. If we were saying that, if we were explaining it to a five year old, I, I I've, I've got kids. Uh, they're part of the reason we're well, for many of us while we're doing this, while we're putting so much effort in. Uh, they're twelve and nine, and I explain it to them a lot, and they they're the carbon experts in their school. So that the other thing as well, we need to we need to talk about carbon itself because we're saying carbon here we actually mean uh, co2 equivalent emissions so that's the suite of uh, chemicals that we pump out into the atmosphere through our activities so it's not just carbon it's co2 to atmosphere equivalent Mm -hmm. that's helpful yeah that was way better than my idea of an explanation but um we've known you guys for a while and you know, we kind of, we were talking about it just before we press record, uh, even before we started the podcast or when we just started the podcast day, or we would, we were talking to James and, and the crew and Joe as well. And, and uh, what you guys have created is phenomenal. And uh, we are, we're a hundred percent behind you. Um, but it would be great to have a little skip and a wonder about around the humble beginnings of zero. Um, Cause it's gained so much momentum over the last 12 months 
uh, globally, not just in the UK, but uh, all over the place. Is that, is that, can you share a little bit about Zero's journey? Uh, yeah, I can have a go. Um, and and uh, so, okay, so four years ago, I read a post from a friend at Atkins in digital space. And it was, it was the, the kind of post that we see uh, quite often. And it just triggered me at that point. And I met up with Will at the time and a few others. And the post was uh, pretty much the founding principle and the continual principle of what Zero is, which is that all of us have a responsibility. It's pretty simple. All of us have a responsibility to, uh, the, to see again, I'm gonna use the word sustainability, but I don't mean sustainability. I mean, just better world, right? Balanced human nature interaction, everything that we're all aiming for. And it triggered me because like, I think most of us and hopefully most of the listeners were all futurists. We love VR and AI and all the cool stuff that we can do. And being a futurist, you kind of live in the future and then you think um, you think about these things for any extended period and you realize the future needs to be built and protected. And that kind of, so it was that, that trigger. I met with Will, a few others, and we kind of hit the idea around a bit about what we could all do personally. And there weren't many places to go. So you couldn't really go to a playbook. We actually talked about playbook in that first, um, that first uh, meet. And we started testing ideas, like should we build an industry group? Should we do this? And that incubated for three years, didn't really do much. And then Joe, I think you, you joined about a year ago, was it? Around that time? Something like that, yeah. Something like that. That's when we kind of actually grew. So that was a few WhatsApp messages. You'll be surprised, Val. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> we entirely on WhatsApp. Um, yeah. yeah, a few WhatsApp messages, and then we we just kind of grew, and the idea grew. So, yeah. A so post- I joined Zero on the basis of Ego to Eco, um, which we've spoken about on the podcast before. Um, and was pointed in James's direction. And I've got a funny feeling it may have been Val who pointed me that way. <laughs> so, um, and as always, I think James has an incredible charisma <laughs> such that I went in to talk to him about Ego to Eco and came out somehow fully embedded in Zero. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, I think Zero personifies everything Ego to Eco is about. Um, it's one of the one of the communities that we want to support in order to make sure that all of that energy, like when people come together and give up their time um, mm. and volunteer in this way, there can be a huge amount of energy and a huge amount of passion. Um, really important that that passion turns into action. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm in there trying to help with that. How do we structure this? How do we make sure it always stays focused on what zero is about um, and that it turns into action? Yeah. Um, Sorry, Val. Just to build on that a bit, the uh, um, what you've done for what you've done in the group, Joe, is, is making sure that that action is franchised for mm-hmm. every individual, every project, every organisation that connects with us, and hopefully next year the thousands of those projects that use the playbook or parts of it or engage with it are action focused. So mm-hmm. not only are we action focused, but the whole mission and uh, everything we do, everything we we'll, 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 if we've got time, we'll talk about <laughs> the plans for building the social network on top of the playbook and everything. But it's all action focused. We, we this is an urgent and straightforward mission. Yeah, no, it's great. It's uh, it's well, it's great to be part of the journey. And I think that uh, the, the momentum is shifting. And I think as you were talking, you know, we are all future people, as you said. And I I love the idea that. Uh, that we are focused on it but but to, to build the future because i've got kids as well it's it's building but it's it's building the future differently because whatever we've done to date we, we can't continue to do and it's, it's kind of an overwhelming responsibility and i know a lot of people in the industry wanted to be involved they just didn't know how and i feel like zero has been a mechanism now that that allows them to be part of something bigger than themselves and contribute to that to that factor because obviously it's very easy to be lost in the project world as you know james and joe uh, you know, the day to days can just, just be enough to, to exhaust you. So the time you get home, you probably got four to five hours. You've got your kids, you've got maybe extra study. You've got a few hours in the night time to do something and then you're ready for the next day. Right, James. And um, how do we, how do we help? So embodied carbon is a big deal. I think governments are, are definitely listening to us. Uh, they're, they're, they're involved. You see a lot of the ESG and embodied carbon type strategies, uh, in, in government, um, 
in government policy. Uh, Australia is a little bit behind, I would say, to be fair, Joe. Uh, we, we, we talk a good game, but uh, we're, not, we're not stepping up to the pitch. Uh, I, would, I would like to know, I think, from your perspective, how is it working with governments and how do you see it working from a project integration perspective, James and Joe, whoever wants to go first? Joe, would you like to go first? And I've got, I, I can follow. I, I've got, yeah, I've got some points on that. It's a good question, Val. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think not being overly ambitious. I think we sometimes think we have to solve these things by coming up with the perfect policy um, or the perfect set of rules or that we've got the solution to fix something, um, especially as project people. We love to have a fix. And I think this is definitely in the systems issue. Um, so I think the fact that zero is bringing together, we've spoken before about the concept of the 3% who can really influence the 85%, um, the sort of people being attracted to things like zero are the 3%. You know, they're people who are going to go back and share what they're doing and share the concepts of what they're hearing with each other and are able to sort of co-create lots of different pathways. And so whilst there's plenty of people working on that policy side and that's brilliant and if zero can have an impact on that great but policy tends to follow action and there's plenty we can do within the constraints of where we're at at this exact moment in time we don't need to wait for the better world or the better leader or the better policy or the better contract um, you work with what you've got um, and in doing that there's a chance you know people are doing amazing things all over the place if we're capturing that and sharing that and someone thinks well actually i can do that at work that's not that hard you know, that's a pretty straightforward one. Just simply asking, you know, are you using the new NEC X29 clause, which is a climate change clause, which is brilliant. You know, that's, that's a big move. It doesn't ask, anyone can do that one. But if you're constantly being asked, are you using this clause, it gets a bit more embarrassing to say each time, oh, actually, we haven't even thought about it. And maybe I better find mm. out what that is. So, so I think we, we often think we have to be heroic. And actually, a lot of this is going to be lots of small steps taken by a lot of people. And that will make a massive difference. I've got nothing to add. <laughs> was, I was, sorry, I was waiting for you to kind of, you, you hit all the, but yeah, all that was all the notes. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Um, I, I, Val, there's another point here that um, we're not looking, I mean, let's say upwards, but let, let's say upwards. We're, we're the people who deliver projects, right? We, deliver, we, we design temporary works, we run programs, we, we do stuff, we procure things, we're, we're we're, we're those people on projects. Um, if we share enough ideas and we can get to 1 million members, let's say, some of the like some of the group are kind of saying numbers like that. Let's, let's billion, say, billion, they're saying a billion, they get very excited. Yeah, someone said, <laughs> someone said, someone said a billion, it was like, okay, well, yeah. Um, if, if, let, let's say we get to 100,000 members in five years, if we, if we can have that kind of explosive growth, um, the, the, obviously the the depth of knowledge across that network and the interactions if we play it right and we cluster people in the right way like regionally and on topics and stream them in a certain way um we can build like v10 joe of the playbook we're, we'll we'll be at that point where we're building a social network on top of and this is an actual digital framework on top of the playbook clustered on topics um that's just change that's that's influence and change it doesn't we don't have to go anywhere near governments and policy we're just changing things because we're changing things joe like so we talk about it in three levels um as when we're talking about the playbook this is a set of modules um they're in sort of six pillars um so the things you'd expect to see leadership etc um, measurement People like to get down deep in exactly how you measure this. They've got their own module. Um, they're creating modules in there. Um, and you can find your, your like people that you know can have a really in-depth discussion with you. Um, but with each of these modules, the intent is that they sort of do three things. One is that they're a chance to share knowledge. You know, it's a chance in a very short, easy to read, anyone can understand, three, four hundred words. What's this about? Whatever the topic is, what is this about? Um, and then there's an opportunity to share, and I, I hesitate to use the word case studies because that makes it sound dry and we've just done case studies so badly all the way through. So I'm thinking stories. Stories are where you've done something on your job that's doable for others so that it sort of inspires other people to do things. And then that third level is the idea of, well, what's something we could do together? You know, what's a, what's a campaign? You know, what's an initiative of something we can go mm -hmm. after as zero 
that this group can work around and anyone who comes in can then join some of those initiatives they can um say that there's other ones to do they don't have to be mammoth you don't need to go and save the world in a single initiative you can do something quite small but it's just the idea of having something to do when you land within the group so that you get to talk with each other you get to you know do you feel like it's moving to action mm. 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 yeah it's it's very interesting even the way you, your team has um put this together is pretty phenomenal i mean anything at scale is difficult but uh, to, to 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 bring people who <laughs> who are intelligent uh, isn't always easy because you know people who are intelligent have opinions and a lot of them are very strong opinions and getting them to corral together under one mission and one purpose i think you've done an excellent job there um well, one question that leads on from that just the way you guys have framed it and the platforms that you're using how important is technology to this this journey this transformation your team is pushing um and what what criticality is it is it is it a must have or you need to have it is it part of the solution, um, James or Joe? Uh, yeah, okay. So technology as in methods and frontier materials and just completely new ways of delivering stuff, structures and things and facades. And the, yeah, the, so is that what you mean? The, the technology? Yes. Construction technology? Yeah, absolutely. Not so much digital and all those fantastic things. That we'll leave digital for a second. We'll get there. <laughs> the AI, VR, like those kind of deep integrations, anything clever. The actual stuff of our world. The way it's yeah. Okay, I I'm conscious that Joe is going to follow this up, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the first. This is most of our meetings in zero, Joe. Even when you're not there, it's like <laughs> what you say. Because I have to be very yeah. So um, let me try that. Um, it's obviously everything because it's the tangible, it's the end product of all this thinking, this mindset change, the social media campaigns we're planning next year, all of that soft stuff isn't building things. So it's everything, but in zero, we're, kind of, we, we're keeping the widest possible angle for you. So frontier materials, uh, concrete that sequesters carbon, uh, not building vanity projects, not putting marble in bathrooms, all these things that we need to do, uh, at the, the tangible end, the hard end, the pointy end of construction. Uh, they're everything, they're 100% of it, because that's where the emissions happen. But it's like, what is it, Joe? It's like 10% of the action we need to take because mm. everything that happens before that. So it's mindset shift, it's building to a million members, it's it's every everything we're doing up to that point. So it's so that that's what we've worked hard on in Zero is ensuring we have the widest possible angle view and we invite in as many people as possible across that spectrum. So diver professional diversity like, is, is a core to what we're doing. So if we find someone missing, we find, what did we find? We found that six months ago, we were kind of quite light on QSs. So we went out and got 10, 15 QSs and brought them in. They're fantastic people, completely activated the champions for lower carbon. And they're on board now and they're kind of working joe on the measurement yeah I think uh, measurement, maybe. group and there's a few in leadership so that's that's how we've kind of fostered diversity so yeah so joe was that an answer about kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So i think is this sort of like the idea that we can techno our way out of this problem because there's that there's at that angle as well to a certain extent of you know do you need to have technology as the means for getting to low embodied carbon or and and i think I think as always, I say this both. <laughs> um, technology will certainly happen, but again, we're not waiting for technology to turn up that will save the day. Um, I think mm. there's a huge amount that can be done at this exact moment in time um, that will have, it, you know, we always have these little bubbles of knowledge. And I think a lot of the work that you guys do on the podcast is bringing those to light and letting people know, you know, did you know such and such is doing brilliant stuff over here? Um, and I think that's what zero is creating is a mechanism to share that really fast. Um, so it's creating mm. that mycelium where that kind of knowledge can share with each other and we can actually just start doing stuff that we can do today that's already being done today by lots and lots of people. There's some really cool technology out there and I wouldn't be surprised if we pretty much have everything we need already. I mean, I'm sure someone's gonna come up with something even better again, but we've gotta be careful. Technology has a way of having ramifications as well. So I'm always very keen. Um, one of the other members of Zero called Gareth, he often talks about uh, people process technology. And that really resonates with me is, you know, start 
with the people, implement some processes that match the people, and then have technology mm. that supports those processes and those people. And so I don't really want technology to come first, any new stuff. I'm really keen to make sure that it actually supports what you're trying to do and technology is doing what it does best, which is a helping hand, an accelerator, something that makes things go a lot faster. Um, that's something that's very efficient, um, but not removing the concept that at the end of the day, this is a very human problem um, that needs us as humans to come together to solve it. Can I build on something here? Can I take, I'm take yeah, okay, so, so nine months ago when we started the workshops, we focused on materials, methods, and technology because we thought they would be the solution. But as soon as you start opening those boxes up, you, you hear all those stories where someone's got this ultra low carbon solution, this additive, this new process, but they can't scale it. So it's okay, well, that, that's not correct. They can't scale it because of all the scale problems we have in the startup. So we put that to one side and we look at frontier materials. So we speak with like the graphene scientists and they're in the lab and they're kind of very early days. So we realized, okay, well, we can't just focus on technology. We can't just focus on these things because we're not gonna go anywhere. And it'd be really boring. So we'd all become like material scientists. So it has to be the things we know. We play to our strengths as a community, don't we? We play to people, mindset, leadership. Who's doing what? How do we change this? And how do we change it just with like, I, I'm gonna, okay, so TikTok videos and engaging new, new ways of engagement. Like we have to have the wide angle view. So technology about, yeah, it is everything, but it's everything else that has to happen too. Yeah, now they're great answers. I think you're right. It, it's a it's a lever, but but introducing new things into any new into any old system is fundamentally another transformation. So you are compounding the problem by introducing new things when the system itself is the problem. And I think the mm. the thing that I, I love the mycelium word and Joe, you brought that to life. Now we, I only use it when you're around because I look like a I look like a, a dick when I do it on my own. But um, I think oh, there Val, is. I there challenge is... you. I challenge you. <laughs> And is that what it's making you look like that? <laughs> Maybe probably, probably you and Dave Snowden, Dave Snowden would be the only ones that would understand what I'm talking about. But I think there's a, there is a value set around just the low hanging fruit as well, which is that somewhat in this process end to end, we find this in project controls where Dale and I feel a bit more comfortable, but you know, there are things we can do fundamentally that shift or move the needle today without changing anything. And I kind of call them, that, that's the dumb process. That's the, the moving block schema where you know that um, part A moves into part B, moves into part C. And there are fundamental rules of the game that you can understand. And then inside those games, there are levers. One of them is technology, we know that. But there are other other, other levers that we can use without, I guess, overburdening uh, the situation. Because again, any investment or any change is gonna cost something and someone has to foot the bill. Uh, so there there is a campaign around what you're saying, which I really, really appreciate because You've, you've got to get the buy-in um, and, and I love the idea that you're not waiting for government because if we were, uh, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. Um, but look, I'm going to bring Dale into this. He's been sitting there quietly waiting. I know he's got a few questions for you. Dale, over to you, mate. Thanks, Val. I'm loving the abuse going your way, Val. So it's all good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, if we rewind a little bit, Joe, you spoke about this playbook. James, you spoke about it as well. Um, but I'll go to Joe first. What could we expect from this playbook? So what do you expect people to do once this playbook is in their hands, right? What do they do with it? What is in there? What, you know, does it give them all the answers or just points at which they could, or options at which they could explore at various points? What, what is this playbook all about? So the, you know, my favorite analogy of trees um, and what's visible and what's invisible. The playbook is a visible bit. It's right. a draw. It's the thing you see that draws you towards zero, draws you towards a basic understanding of some of the elements. If we tried to write down the complexity of this, I mean, even just the interwovenness is <laughs> almost impossible to get your head around. Um, it, it's not supposed to be, actually, it's almost meant to be slightly wrong um, because that will encourage people to come along and say, wait, just a sec. And it's like, brilliant, come join the gang and tell us how we got it wrong. And let's, let's work on this together. So the aim at all times of zero is to bring people together, um, to allow social learning from each other, uh, to share knowledge, 
and the playbook is the draw card for getting you to basically the right part of zero <laughs> to support that type of learning. So if you want to go in depth and you want to go a bit more deep on, if you're a real leadership person, if you're a real measurement person, um, if you're a real design person, you'll find your, your tribe in there that you can have a really in-depth proper conversation with to really tackle things and then there's lots and lots of socials and lots of other events that then pull people together across those layers um, so the playbook is really a function of how do you do the social learning um, it is no more than three four hundred words for each module um, of course you can barely even touch the surface of anything when you're writing that much about this sort of complexity so it's as much just to get a, a concept of you know is this something I'm interested in is this something I want to know better um, we're hoping to have things like um, the stories that you can share so what have people done in this space that kind of inspires you I think that's where we head off with to, to TikTok with James sometimes or all sorts of <laughs> other ways of how to share those stories in lots and lots of different media we've got some really brilliant and enthusiastic people throughout Zero who are incredibly good at doing diagrams and podcasting and lots of really excited ideas on how you bring those modules to life in terms of sharing real stories um, one of my favorite is the idea that we could potentially do a carbon walk around a site so in the way that you do a safety walk around, you could do a carbon yeah. walk around and it's like helping, you know, as you walk around the side, it's sort of, uh, you know, why are you having to separate out those materials? Well, that's because that's going to count towards this particular thing, you know, helping people understand their action on the ground and what that actually means um, for getting, uh, for dealing with carbon. And then it's sort of the bigger initiatives. It's sort of actually we could join these three modules together and run an initiative that really tackles um, maybe my, I've got to, I constantly talk about this one because I'm always very excited about clauses and contracts, um, but the NEC clause, I think it has a lot of legs to it. It has a lot of basis because if we can get to a standardized benchmark and the NEC clause is trying to help make that happen, um, then we can start talking about things like tax incentives. We can start putting it within our projects that you have to, you know, here's the baseline of embodied carbon. Can you do better? And, and contractors are really keen to try and show off what they're capable of doing. You know, it's a, at the moment, it's a differentiator. The fact that you know how to reduce embodied carbon, it will become a bit of a, you can no longer play the game because you don't, you know, you're, you haven't come up with new ways to remove embodied carbon. It will be an expectation that you limit the amount of embodied carbon. And so I think um, the playbook's trying to draw people together. Sorry, James, I'm sure you've got plenty more to say on this one. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm taking notes. I don't know if you can see. I'm, I'm taking notes here. I'm just kind of taking notes and trying to trying to find the gaps in what you said. It's no, it's that's perfect. It's everything. Can I can I add in just a few tangibles? So some of the modules are, Joe, as you say, huge, like inspire, change, foster innovation, MMC. <laughs> I think these are topics that there are hundreds of books on. So that's not what we're doing. There's no, this isn't a pathway to lowering your embodied carbon. As more, it's more exactly as you say, Joe, it's to connect with the author, uh, to comment. So we, we want to inspire a little bit of conversation and then come to events, join in. And if you've got new ideas for more modules, if you want to break some out, uh, there's already I think 10 or 12 spin out groups that have just spun out from these topics. Um, so yeah, like the financial case in Asia for lowering body carbon, like that group's just spun out and gone site. So th th that's what we are. That's what we want to be. Amazing. Amazing. And cue Mr. Glenn Hyde back for a, an episode on NEC, I think, Val. Um, mm. But sticking, sticking with you there, James, uh, you mentioned franchises as well. Is that what you meant by these little, spin-offs going all over the show what what's what's franchising within zero maybe okay so to answer that i'd probably have to the, the talk about the tension between structuring and organic chaotic growth yeah and at the moment because it's growing so quickly and certainly the last month joe has been insane mm -hmm. right now uh not not so much growth in numbers but growth in people getting involved who are on our list of 800 so we're we try and apply structure to it and hierarchy and decision making but it's growing so quickly it's, it's 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 pretty chaotic i think i think we're kind of doubling down on that we're going to say like this is agile and chaotic and dispersed go for it just keep going if you're if you're and we've we've got a middle east chapter we've got uh, australia obviously starting or growing there that but yeah that like uh chapters appearing people clustering on topics 
we probably need to capture our values and what we're aiming for again and keep repeating that but that's it and it's hands off because we can't we can't we can't get to fifty thousand people yeah i mean i think it's really fundamental that whilst this is global and that lets for some fairly amazing sharing like what are different countries doing in these various spaces and that's that's really important and fundamental um, but at the end of the day, action happens locally because it needs to be in the context of the region. It needs to be in the context even of the particular building site. Um, so it's holding that tension between let's go global and mammoth and let's make sure we've got as many people going as because you want as many people activated to doing this as you can possibly get. There's, there's no limit to that as long as they're active and they're doing things. Uh, zero can go as big as it wants. Um, but at the end of the day, it needs to really encourage local action and local people getting together, often as face-to-face -face as much as you can. There seems to be a lot of beer kegs involved, as far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> exactly, no, it's brilliant. It's got such a lot of energy from that point of view. Um, and in terms of, uh, I hesitate to say there's no structure, <laughs> given that that's my, <laughs> my favorite thing, um, but it is, the, it is the really subtle act of how do you put governance, real governance, just meaning how do you make decisions in something like this? Um, that align to the values that take into account all the different perspectives um, and how do you make sure that that as it grows it doesn't it, it doesn't lose its organic nature and chaotic nature because that's actually fundamental you know that's part of the energy and the buzz and the letting people bump and have serendipitous meetings and have that spark of an idea and feel like they can own it because they can come up with a crazy idea and James has the best way of going yeah brilliant go for it <laughs> really simple decision pathway isn't it we just yeah. say yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then see where it keeps going yeah so. yeah there's, there's always a yes to this but the yes needs to fit within some sort of structure and that's something i'm really deeply interested in is in these incredibly complex self-organizing communities where most people are working voluntarily out of pure energy and drive and a passion to change um how do you turn that into action how do you make people how do you have enough structure that they feel that it's turning, you know, it's going somewhere without losing that energy? And we're doing a huge amount of thinking around that in the background, um, decision-making frameworks and uh, ways of setting up the governance that isn't laborious. I think it has some sort of football team analogy, doesn't it, James, at the moment? <laughs> no, we want from that for a number of reasons, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it goes straight to see look this changes on a regular basis as everybody has an opinion but actually it works it but it works remarkably well um and for me it's just a phenomenal social experiment <laughs> to see how these sorts of communities can grow and come together and actually function really well um without having laborious amounts of governance around them absolutely i can see why you love it joe because the whole organic nature of it right yeah. um and it's almost if you bring in sort of laws of nature right yeah. even though they aren't strict laws so to speak they are a set of laws upon yeah. which nature grows and, and this is it sounds like what you're trying to do here is have that freedom within that framework i know with previous discussion with you you don't really like the word framework or methodology because it <laughs> sounds like you're well, constraining yeah exactly but it sounds like you, you, you're trying to create that that freedom within that framework to say yes you know we want to be organic but at the same time we've got to make sure we're heading in more or less the same di direction otherwise we, we, we're pulling in opposite directions so that's that's quite interesting within itself um but i wanted to ask you a little bit more about the social networks um because a lot of times you you think social network you think social media you did talk about TikTok and things like that. I just wonder, though, um, given this framework and the values, and I know you haven't mentioned it yet, or you haven't thought about or nailed it down yet, James, but if if I had to sort of put you on the spot, what are some of the values that you're thinking about that would sort of give people their, their, their North Star when thinking about this the social network, this this community of people. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, right. So, in as a tangible, and we've been brought back to this a number of times. It's the five billion tons of carbon equivalent emissions that we're uh, emitting into the atmosphere from the construction industry. 
if we're not taking a step to reducing that in anything we do or any module that's written or any connection that's made, that's fine. We we just need to we we don't do that stuff. So that's our decision. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not a value, is it? It's it's a way of making decisions, a way of but I think values are at their best when they help you make decisions. And I yeah. think that is fundamental that it that this heads towards I me. Mean, it's basically saying save the planet. <laughs> Even but it's saving the planet in a very specific or, or realm. Yeah. Keep, keep Earth habitable for humans for as long as possible. That's a pre pretty simple kind of North Star for us, isn't it? And it's it's something that is easy to then build energy around. And that's actually what's attracted people is because we all probably want a habitable planet. So mm -hmm. that's why it's, uh, or, which is also a challenge because um, in transformations that we've all been through, like oh, digital safety, over the last 30 years. It's 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 just different because we have time, whereas this one we don't, we don't, we have our own, there's an external framework of time that we need to work with. I think the other one is action oriented. Yeah. Um, it's a real value of zero and a constant question of, yep, we can sit here and chat about this particular topic and really enjoy, you know, which policy should go into place or something that might be happening in 20 years' time. Nothing wrong with having that conversation. But at the end of the day, zero is really focused on what can we do today? You, know, you and, and what can I do today? It's yeah. not they should be doing this, that and mm. the other. It's not moaning about everybody else. If only they did this and I could do my bit. It's like, given the constraints that you sit in, what can I do today? And so having that as a very strong focus um, really helps to drive where you put the modules and how you think about all the various elements. And it does have a lot of energy to it because when <laughs> if you do crack it you feel like you've made and and it stops people feeling so overwhelmed um these big topics whilst enjoyable over a beer um get a bit frightening when you think how am i how am i personally going to do anything to do anything about them so i think the idea of just a small step um mm. and and also half of us are wondering what that small step is like it just sort of where do i even start to try and do this so I think there's something really powerful about having people sort of saying, well, I've done that. And you're like, oh, I could try that one. That one's not too hard. Can, can you can you share some examples? So those listening going, if, if we put it to the listener right now, if you're listening to this podcast and you ask yourself, what can you do right now, right? What are some hints or tips, Joe, that you could share <laughs> that you've heard that could inspire the listener? Well, I mean, it's as simple as, oh, sorry, I'll go back to my NEC clause because it's one I was looking at today <laughs> and it's on my brain. <laughs> but it is as simple as what we we're saying before about the idea of simply asking, you know, I mean, even just, even if you take it away from the NEC clause and you take it to what, how's my company? Like, is this in your, you've got a net zero target in, my, in the organization. Um, could you just explain to me how in our organization embodied carbon is playing into that net zero cause? So literally asking the question, of, you know, is there some sort of pathway within our organization that is showing the pathway to um, net zero, including, is it including embodied carbon? How are we measuring that? So share that measuring with the measuring team, because there's about 5,000 different, actually, I'm, I'm probably underestimating that by a long shot, different ways of calculating embodied carbon at this point in time. Nothing wrong with that. It's brilliant that all these companies are trying this, but at some point it's going to have to come up with some sort of standardized form. The more that we can pull those together into the central zone, and then all of us look at them and kind of go, well, actually there's common threads through here. All of these do the same things from this point of view. And actually the ones that are working are the ones that are interoperable with SAP and P6 and you know all these other things so that you, they can just naturally draw it into. That makes a good one. So it's sort of, you know, but you can play your part just by going, how are we calculating it? Do Are we calculating it? Does anyone in here even know what this is? <laughs> so really simple things like that, asking questions at this stage, huge. But I've just learned so much about different materials. Um, I, you know, I'll never look at a copper pipe the same way. We've had, you know, how extraction of a copper pipe works and the degradation to the sites. And you're suddenly thinking, oh, my God, of course we should be recycling copper, really choosing which material we use, you know, actually asking that question of every other material. So just a second, have we actually looked at these materials from an embodied carbon point of view, as opposed to just the operational carbon or the circularity? Um, so, yeah, it's just, uh, uh, it's opening my mind to new questions to ask when I'm looking at these sorts of moments in time. 
I don't know where you'd be with it on, James. Uh, yeah, again, same thing. Uh, but something we need to do in the playbook and are doing is uh, we'll, we'll have probably some persona uh, work at the front end. So and, and professional plus other. So if you are a mechanical engineer, yeah. you probably want to look at these topics. And then from those, you'll find others. So there's there, there's some work we'll do. Um, like other examples, I mean, just ask, you, Joe, as you say, asking your organization, asking the project you're on, have we any idea of the embodied carbon on this? What's the number? Is it 40,000 kilotons? Is it 40,000 tons? Is it, is it X? Are we measure, is anyone measuring it? Is anyone doing this? Um, yeah, that, having that expectation, that literacy, that carbon literacy, just, just learning about carbon, like 200 grams for a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, or is it four grams per uh, WhatsApp message? We get through quite a lot of that. So what, what do we do? Is it 20 tons per car? Is it 1,000 mm. for a house, 40,000 for a high rise? Like, we don't know that yet, do we? We don't have that carbon literacy. So I, get, I guess a good action is to go and learn this stuff, just get a feel for it. And then you go back to your projects and say, you're watching the concrete wagons come in every day and you're thinking, okay, well, that's, that's 140 tons of carbon every time we have an eight, uh, eight yard wagon come in. Like what, what, what is that? Well, what we just, just kind of bringing carbon to the surface is so important. Do you remember the days when food items didn't have the calories on them? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What we're actually talking about now is yeah, can yeah. we get to a stage where either they're labeled or there's some sort of barcoding system or something where we're conscious of what we're actually contributing when we're constructing projects right it's it's, i mean it's really interesting because like I, I look at this from a decision making process and there's been so much focus on the operational carbon like there's there's been a huge amount of focus in the last 20 or so years and that's had a massive impact like every every building now has led lighting you know they really think about what hvac system they put in there's a lot of thinking that's gone into that space and i recently went to um to, a, to an opening of um, a product designer's place but he'd just done a renovation and i was asking him because i don't normally ask this question but it's like what was the embodied carbon of your build new build because he He'd been telling me about the embodied carbon of each of the products he was making. So I was like, how did you think about it for your build? And he goes, well, that was a really interesting discussion because at the beginning, we were, we were, we were going to go for a whole new building. We we're going to take down the two old buildings because from an operational point of view, they were rubbish. You know, they, had, they leak all over the place. And so to get a really new, modern, non-leaking building, we we're going to build a new one. And then they went through a whole year of planning and then had a sudden moment of just a sec, we're all about embodied carbon with the way we do our product design. <laughs> we need to reflect that in how we do our build. And so they started looking at the embodied carbon and they ended up putting an insert in and then putting a heck of a lot of insulation into the existing buildings. And they saved over 40% embodied carbon, which would have taken more than the lifespan of the building to make back in the operational carbon. And I just found that really interesting concept of just putting that thinking in at the front end and the knock-on impact of that and the fact that we've kind of been a bit on autopilot, thinking mainly about operational and to suddenly add embodied when it was cheaper. You know, it was mm. a cheaper build, a quicker build, and also represented the values of their company. So a really nice combination of things. Yeah, absolutely. Go, go ahead, James. There's something to add to that. So if you, if you, if you graph... Uh, embodied carbon saved for the first three years of a project, the construction bit, and then you add 50 years for the operational. You've got very flat, low level for operational, very high for embodied. And it's, there's a bit of a waterbed. So if you, if you push down on this, if you push down on your operational, if you really sh shrink that down, you can easily pop up your embodied carbon because you're putting more stuff in or the solar cells or pump, heat pumps. So there's also the argument to be had that we need to keep carbon out of the atmosphere for as long as possible. So you really want to push the front end of the waterbed down. So in Joe's example there, you're getting 40% off this. Even if the operational carbon's higher, it's better to pay that cost over the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. Thank us for that. So there's there's more to it than, yeah. And the, the, so concrete or cement production is 8% of all emissions. 
that's two thirds of embodied carbon. That's a big one. If we can flip concrete in the next 20 years, if we can turn it from an emitter to a sequester, if we can get carbon negative concrete, that's it. The, the entire construction wow. industry has paid for itself. So there's some huge fundamental points here. So we can talk about lean planning and AI and stripping out projects and modern methods of construction. We can talk about all these marginal gains, but at some point we're going to come up against this in zero. We're going to have to look properly at concrete because if, again, if we can flip concrete, that's the problem solved. Mm. Anyway, wow. bit of a, yeah, kind of just well, hope... that big one, the, the, some of the big stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Well, hopefully those listening, um, you know, someone comes and goes, I've got an idea or maybe more than one, but we've got a few of them. <laughs> there's, there's, there's at least that we, we meet uh, like one startup a week who are doing this. There's, there's at oh. least 50 on our books uh, from all different areas of concrete uh, decarbonization. Amazing. Amazing. Hopefully we can add to that. Mm. Look in machine gun Martin's absence. I want to try and ask a little bit of a provocative one. <laughs> Extinction rebellion. <laughs> right. They're huge on obviously carbon as well. And a lot of people listening to this might think, oh, are there similarities to be drawn? Are there? We had that in a call recently, didn't we, Joe? Yeah. yeah. So someone who joined our call, hadn't been here before, said, oh, you guys are a little bit like Extinction Rebellion. You're chaotic, you're activating. Our response, Joe, was... That um, Extinction Rebellion are activists. They're, import they're, they're trying to put external pressure on... Um, parliamentarians and policymakers and key influencers to make the change. We are the activators. We're in the deep mycelium of projects and we're making the change within, within the constraints of what we work within. This is not a protest group. You know, we're not gonna be um, sticking ourselves <laughs> to any walls anytime soon. We are taking very pragmatic steps of what can we do within our projects with a real understanding of how projects work. Amazing. and. Ladies and gents, that is unscripted. I didn't even prep them for that, but it it paints a very good picture of where you're actually placing yourself. And I think a, I think a more realistic one for people to actually buy into, rather than this go, you know, as you say, you know, chain yourself to a gate or something like that. Um, Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I think that they're doing like things like that is not bad. It needs both. Like you think about the suffragettes and the suffragists. Mm. You know, it it neither would have worked without the other. And it's not like I'll ever be the sort of person who can do that type of thing. But I've got a lot of respect for people who believe in their beliefs that strongly that they're willing to do that. So, uh, I, but I get that change has to happen within, but they've opened up a window for that conversation to happen in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Val, you've been listening quietly there. Let's bring you back into the I conversation. Have. I was actually just on the WhatsApp. I was talking to the, uh, the other Zero members. But anyway, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> It's very distracting. <laughs> it is. It is Chaotic. Uh, Are you fact-checking us? <laughs> no, no, no. Never. Yeah. Are oh. they throwing questions in from the sidelines? <laughs> hey, James, James just trouble, said this. James. What, is he, what is he talking about? Uh, no, no, I wasn't. I, I, I was thinking about it because I was thinking about the, you know, the value. And it comes back to two by two, right? I can't help myself. I'm a consultant. But, uh, you know, the, I guess the change impact and the effort I see as the, as the two by two. And I was thinking about biggest bang for buck. And I was thinking about how do you prioritize the, the most amount of change? And you mentioned concrete, which is great because I was thinking about that, the material side of things. Um, how, how, how do we then change the procurement model? Because I think you were talking, Joe, about the contract, but, but procurement, how we purchase, the purchasing power and the lever that you have there as well, seems to be a big one that would be great to utilize um, or incentivize. Um, have you talked about procurement and how does that play into this embodied carbon journey? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'd actually say that one of the things I sit with zero a lot on is you're doing embodied carbon. If it touches procurement, great. Um, but there's actually a fantastic group who are doing a lot of work in this space, who are the ones who came up with the NEC contractual clause, which is a bunch of lawyers who are deeply passionate about changing the way procurement works and are writing the clauses that let this happen. So in some respects, yes, of course, it's a procurement issue. I think there's a lot of conversations that go on around supply chain resilience, um, which I look at from the ecosystem point of view of, you know, having had all of our supply chains completely knocked out of whack over the last two to three years, um, we really need to 
think differently about how our supply chains work in any case. Um, and so if you're going to think differently, you might as well build all of this in. And we're finding that there's a lot of people who want to do that anyway. So I think there is definitely a role that Zero can play within that space. Um, mm -hmm. But there are other groups who are doing fantastic work that Zero can can feed off. Mm -hmm. James, anything from you there? No, nothing to add. That's great. Yeah, great. So it's kind of like the nutcracker then. And so concrete might be one of those nuts we have to crack uh, from a zero perspective. Um, what are the other nuts if you think about big and bold? I mean, it really is just cement production. So if we can flip cement production, everything else we can go wild on. <laughs> Good point. Because it's 8% it's of all emissions. It's 3.6. Yeah. Like this it's a it's a big chunk it's pretty much but then again we there's no point focusing on concrete because concrete's not going to change itself it's the humans isn't it it's mindset it's leadership it's procurement it's everything else it's specifications it's awareness it's tiktok videos it's the whole thing that happens before that concrete wagon turns up to that site so it's the 57 things that have to happen beforehand that we're focused on to change that concrete and I think we've proven as humans that we're really rubbish at guessing what the lever for change actually is. Um, we've got mm. lots of records of us not being right in this category. Um, as a, as a, and it's not saying that concrete isn't the one to go for. Um, it's the fact that the lever that creates that change for concrete or creates that change for steel or creates that change for how we procure, um, that might be something completely bizarre. So the fact that you get a million people thinking about this in all sorts of different ways who are bringing all sorts of different perspectives in um, they get to have a chance to have a go. <laughs> I mean, that's what mm. that's how change works is by lots and lots of things. And one of those will take off that we've never even thought of before. Um, and that's what this is opening up is that possibility for lots and lots and lots of little experiments in a very safe place with lots of enthusiastic people who say, yeah, why not? Let's have a go. So yes. if you're sitting in your office going slightly frustrated because you've got a brilliant idea that you can't get anyone to hear, come chat to us. Mm. We have plenty of people who would love to help you make that real. Or if you have no ideas at all, but yeah, please come to us. You'll have yeah. some as soon as you arrive. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of work to be done. So yeah. <laughs> if you want the habitable planet, come and see us. That's it. That's the only prereq for it. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I was um, one of the things you were talking about. I guess moving to transformation as well. Um, Joe and James, you mentioned a few times on this pod. It's 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 a human journey. And we, we often forget that, right? We, we think the target is, let's say it's concrete and we think that's the target, but it's not, right? It's, it's part of an integrated system and, and delivering a project is an integrated body of work. And so you don't have one artist, you have many, right? And it's, it's the idle hands of many that, that makes the effort um, long lasting. And I think we've, we've done this on so many different projects and we've done it so badly, Joe, as you know, when it comes to trying to introduce something better with a great idea and a great intent, and we think this is going to be the thing that makes things better. And we go to introduce it and we've made it not worse, but definitely harder. And, uh, but, but I think with a lot of projects they're they're kind of midway. And one of the questions I, I do have is, so the, the projects are getting longer. Um, they're obviously getting more complicated in to a degree. Um, I, I don't think they're too hard, but there are many moving parts. One of the changes we had challenges we have is how do you stop a moving train or how do you, improve something that's already begun because again we might have some great answers but again it's a bit like project controls if we're not brought on early enough we've kind of missed our opportunity to make the valuable change and then we're constantly trying to catch up with ourselves to make the projects better and i was just wondering is there a time where it's too late to make change on current in-flight programs or when is the window of opportunity for zero from from your perspective or from your uh, conversations I mean, really, ideally, day one, you'd want to come in with this thinking. The reality yeah. is, is that's not how it's going to work. And that's part of the power of this group is it's what can you do with what you've got? Because um, it's very easy to get into the mindset of oh, it's too late. Um, or if only they'd done this, then we could have saved the planet. But oh, well, we can't now. Um, the reality is, is right up until the moment that you hand that building over into operations, <laughs> you have a chance to make a change and a difference and to do something slightly better. And the reality is, is that when you do a small thing, you have no idea the ripple effect that that has. 
someone else on a different project that maybe just a little bit further back from you will do something different that time. And, you know, it's sort of this ripple effect that you've got to consider as well. It's not about one project at a time. And this is, mm. this is a global change and it needs, I mean, great. You're learning about how to change it at the last second and that's going to be needed as well. So I just, I don't think we should get too caught up in a solution, the solution, the right way to do it. I don't think any of us have figured that out yet. And so we have to try everything we can. And we have to hear from people who aren't the experts. Um, I love the fact that the vast majority of people who are joining Zero, nothing wrong with having a sustainability background. We're really grateful to have people in there that have that sort of knowledge. But actually, they're just, they're just the, the standard people on the project right the way through at every single level and every single grade. And there's something you can do at every single one of those levels that will make a difference. And it's the fact there's a lot of you doing it and you get to report it back to somewhere where it gets captured and gets shared that has the impact. You may not feel it on your particular project, but you should know that it's, it's changing things. Mm. James, do you want time in there? You... No, I'm just taking notes for the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think, yeah, I was going to say, I think there is a, there's something along, maybe there's, there's options for each part of the life cycle you're in. You know, it's kind of a journey along. If you're in this phase, hear him then creating perhaps... a framework here. <laughs> Join the chaos. Join the chaos, Val. <laughs> Let go. No, yeah, I've drawn the influence over time graph and little oh, you know, little modules that because so the playbook sits on where well, it maps to a life cycle of the project, obviously. Well, mm. so. I mean, in answer to the question, yeah, Joe, you've covered it, but just to add to it even more, it's not what you. It's not necessarily what you can do on your project right now. It's the influence you have. And Joe, you talk about influence and the ability to kind of reach out into your organization. We want to give people those tools as well. The fact that, hey, look, you know, just get carbon literate, learn, learn how many grams of carbon every time you drink a cup of coffee, learn these things, get used to it, get familiar with it, start thinking about carbon, start expecting uh, uh, an embodied carbon number over the top of every project you will work on in the future like get that conversation going just talk with people about carbon go and learn it it's not that complex it's pretty mm. straightforward and create mm. a bit of fomo i mean if you, you're coming back with lots of stories that says uh the other five contractors are doing it and we're not there's an element of change that will happen out of the back of that as well absolutely well that's that's my follow-on and maybe my last question joe just sorry interrupt is is you know, if, if there are people listening to this, hopefully they are, they haven't tuned out yet, but uh, they're, they're thinking about joining, they're thinking about getting involved, um, or they're thinking about educating themselves. Is training and education part of your mission? Um, teaching people? No? <laughs> James, you need to say your, your favorite claw, your favorite <laughs> phrase. <laughs> oh. uh, no, at all. Not really, Joe. Is it? Is it? I, I don't. Well, your answer is always after the playbook. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's his catchphrase at the moment for all brilliant ideas. Perfect. After the playbook, we will look into this. I think we talk about social learning. We talk a lot about social learning. Um, mm. So it's not so much that you capture it in a, here's a perfect module that you can pop into your Arab University or other, you know, there's lots of people doing brilliant, brilliant work in this space of helping people understand carbon literacy. Um, and I'm sure there'll end up being a module where we point to some brilliant learnings. Uh, the intent isn't to replicate that by any stretch, but you will learn simply by being around all these people talking in context around real issues. Um, the, the learning curve is steep. Yeah, learn mm. by doing, learn by being here. Yeah. And I was just about to say yeah. earlier that we really should have had James live sketching because that's actually what he tends to do in these is he'll come up with a brilliant set of meeting minutes, which are actually a series of really cool graphics. And I think a lot of the power of zero is his ability to capture this in that way. We, we have got, thank you, Joe, that we've got some really good people coming in to do that through next year because some of these conversations, are complex conversations, obviously, and you need to see it. It's, Yeah. It's, it's weird because it's a topic that's reasonably straightforward. Everything attracts carbon. Every activity we do attracts it. So everything's got a number above it. Once you get that, once you get your head around that, changing it is complex. Getting that change is the hard bit. And that's, yeah, anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
No, no, it's great. I think as well, you, you know, the, the social impact that you're going to have, you know, the TikToks, wherever you're going to go with it, it needs to be visual. You know, you need to reach to the market and understand. The, the quickest way I've, I've seen, because I do it as well, is, is through symbols and stories and drawings. This is the great the great way of speaking to other humans. Um, I am worried that uh, you guys have got a, a big task in your hand. We you probably need more people. So um, do let us know if there's any websites they need to go to or anywhere they need to go to check out your information. Is there a website you wanted to plug there, James? Uh, yeah, so zeroconstruct.com. That's Z-E-R-O-C-O-N. S T R U C T dot com. <laughs> Spelling <Excellent>. live. <laughs> and it's after Perfect. nine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just go there, uh, hit the membership button, and you'll you, it's like a sixty second form, and that will you'll you'll build up a little persona, uh, your profession, your interest, your region. And you'll hopefully quite soon in the next couple of weeks be filtered into one of our groups or topics. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I think we got a, I don't know how long back now, but we've, we've got a little uh, post roll at the end of every episode um, around where folks can go as well, but um, it's great to hear it from the horse's bath. I was thinking about what you were saying and also what Val was saying around visual. I was thinking, well, webinars, all these days expos as well but they're you know they're, they're things that people can see and feel and touch and if this is if we're on if we're in the stage where we're trying to educate everyone what about having something where we get all of the people around um whether it's in a conference room or a big hall and set up a store whatever the case may be saying this is what we can do with technology leadership as you say this is how we measure this is how we do things and it's all in one place and it might just be for you know a day or two but i feel like the energy you create with so many people in one place from there expands um so i don't know maybe there's something we can do in that space so can i yeah i'll throw out some ideas that will uh, i'll definitely after the playbook that are on the table at the moment <laughs> I remember all of them so there's so many brilliant people coming up with great ideas so first one is to turn the modules into a deck of playing cards. There's 70 of them, like top trumps. You remember the kind of, you know, that by doing yeah. this, your impact will be this. These are your superpowers. So you could have that. They could be NFTs, Joe. We need to talk about the carbon footprint of having of, of non-fungible tokens and the blockchain. But we could, we could have some kind of collectible on some of these modules. Uh, we are probably going to build a metaverse module for all of this. So there'll be some kind of, uh, some kind of space that you can go into, interact with, with. the ego to eco trees. With the trees and walking through the forest and the modules sit there and you can interact. And uh, we, we run in-person workshops as well. So that, that and they'll all be hybrid next year. So uh, plenty of options for what we do next. Build a wow. playbook. That's the foundation. And then, yeah, everything. Build a playbook. I was also thinking perhaps Monopoly, you know, who can own the most properties with zero carbon? <laughs> i'm struggling with know. the capitalist <laughs> i don't know you know how, how do you mix in as you say capitalism with with carbon because <laughs> it's not going to go away right um but anyway lots lots of ideas to play with so folks get yourself onto uh the website first and foremost and then onto a whatsapp group so you can be as distracted as val was throughout this entire episode <laughs> <laughs> no he wasn't too too distracted look folks an hour has gone by very very quickly and you know we could probably speak uh, for a few more hours um, if not days but we will let you go before we do though we do have and joe you've you've had this before fiverr um where we just ask you five quick fire questions james i don't know if you've had it um when you came on previously but we'll take you both through it anyway um and joe if there are repeats you feel free to change your answer from last time <laughs> so if you're both ready and willing mm -hmm. i see nods i see nods okay it's just five quick fire <laughs> questions right number one and i'll go joe first and then and then james just to give james a bit of a you know warm up there uh so question one steak seafood or salad salad i'm definitely trying to reduce my amount of meat <laughs> uh, seafood question two are, are leaders born or made? 
we could have an entire discussion about leaders. <laughs> I refuse to answer. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll accept, James. Um, does made include self-made? Yeah. Why not? That, no, I, think, I, I don't feel like anyone's born a natural leader, right, Joe? No, no one's born a natural leader, Val. We, we build it for ourselves because we, we're set a mission. We give ourselves a mission and go, well, the only way I'm going to get to this mission is to learn how to lead. And that could be like a six-year-old or a 60-year-old. So it's self-made, isn't it? Is that too long an answer? No, not at <laughs> all. It's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, question three, what is one piece of advice for people new to the project profession? Realize that you will be continuously learning and be very open to that and ask as many questions as you can. James? Uh, yeah, just to appreciate the time scale as well. Like you, when, you're, when you're starting out, you've been learning for a very short period of time and you're going to be learning and working for 40, 50 years or forever, really. Yeah. It's a long time. You've got loads of time. Don't rush. Growth mindset, indeed. Question four. If you could go back to one moment of your life, what would it be and why? <laughs> I, I got all the classics of weddings and babies being born, but I really don't want to go back to that baby being born. I mean, the baby was brilliant, <laughs> but yeah, what happened just before that? I'm really not up for going again. So I'm going to stick with wedding. We'll go for my wedding day, mainly because it was a chance to have all of my favorite people in the room. It was such a crazy day. It was just a reminder of everything that's about community and coming together and celebrating what's important in life. Amazing. James? Oh, mine's not a, a social at all. It was jumping out of an airplane. Uh, <laughs> years ago. This is why we compliment so well. Yeah. <laughs> just massive adrenaline rush, really simple, really what you'd expect. It's really cold, loud, and you just jump. Yeah, that'd be cool. Wow. Wow. And the last one Which superpower would you choose to have for a day and why? real compassion just to really i mean i don't know if you could last for more than a day to have full open compassion but just to really be able to step in and understand other people's experience and see how they're seeing the world and sit beside people and really be there i just think it's something i i, I really work toward but i don't know if i achieve very often um and just to be able to do that properly would be amazing awesome james Wow. Uh, to time travel. <laughs> Joe, again. <yeah. laughs> Just time travel. To be, able to, to be able to go back to the asteroid hitting the Earth or that, like the first life emerging out of the primordial soup or go forward in time and see, like, yeah. That would be cool. I, I'm up for both, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one too. <laughs> oh, amazing. Joe Lucas, James Bold, it's amazing to have you both back. We will definitely have you back again in the future. Um, we obviously are actively involved in what you're doing and following avidly and support you wholeheartedly in, in, in this whole movement, if we can call it that, um, for lack of a better word. But it, it's, you know, hats off to to all of you, um, you know, with, with what we're trying to do here. Uh, before we let you go, though, as per usual, any final thoughts that you want to leave our listeners with? I'll start with you, Joe. I'd just say, come join, you know, come learn, come enjoy. It's, it's brilliant what James and the whole team have been building. Um, and I just think this is the future is us coming together in communities and sharing what we know um, and being open to that. Absolutely. James. Yeah. Similar, similar Dale. Um, the, Whoever, yeah, we, all of us can make a difference. Or, our, okay, a step before that, construction needs to change. It definitely needs to change, and we all are part of that solution. So, yeah, come and join us. Awesome, Val. How about you? No, great. Thanks for being on and uh, you know having a late night with us. It was fantastic to understand a little bit more about embodied carbon, and I did understand a little bit of it. So that's good. Pass. Um, for me, it's hard to grasp new topics. So it, it's, it's been floating around in my mind, the, the definition, but I think you guys did a really good job of explaining it to everybody. And please join. Everyone should join. Check it out, Zero. Uh, it's been great. Thanks, guys.
Absolutely. Folks, there you go. Go ahead and join as soon as you finish listening to the end of this podcast. But before you go, if you like what you've heard, please do help us pay it forward uh, and share a link to this episode on your favorite social media, maybe your favorite social network as well, um, because that's what we're creating here. So um, please do help us pay it forward. It's an amazing, amazing cause and get involved. And remember to ask yourselves those questions. What can you do today? Once again, a massive, massive thank you to our guests, Joe Lucas and James Bowles. And thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now.